Cemetery in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, Mount Auburn is a National Historic Landmark. It is the first of three rural or garden cemeteries in the United States um, and set the model for many rural cemeteries to follow. It's uh, about 175 acres and would straddle the line of Cambridge and Watertown, Massachusetts. I hope that if some of you uh, have not been to uh, Mount Auburn, that uh, if you're in the Boston area, you'll come and visit and see the grounds. Today, David and I are going to talk about lead, which is now a much maligned material that historically, though, was used extensively in monument and mausoleum, mausoleum work. We found lead of interest because the more we looked at Mount Auburn, the more monuments we repaired and mausolea that we, we pointed, the more lead we saw. And we knew that we had to learn more about the material and the, for the forgotten skills needed to use it to pro uh, in order to best preserve the historic fabric and carry out our role as stewards of the historic site. Lead has been used for thousands of years in the building trades in general, but seems to have been very popular in the monument setting trade for a period in the late 19th and 20th, early 20th century. It's fallen out of favor in general, though, since the 1950s as new materials have come along. And in the last few decades, especially as its potential toxicity has required stricter regulations for its handling and use. And so when I arrived at Mount Auburn in the late 1990s, lead wool was still in use occasionally for repair and repointing of mausolea primarily, but we noticed many other applications and forms for its use and realized that we would have to reacquire some of the skills necessary in order to use it properly. So just a brief outline of what we're going to, uh, David and I will talk about today. First, I'll discuss briefly the properties of lead that make it uh, a uh, valuable material. Talk about some of the historical sources and uses of it and its historical use at Mount Auburn. And then David's going to discuss some projects recently carried out at Mount Auburn. Um, and before I go any further, I, I would like to thank the NCPTT for a grant that funded some additional documentary archival research that we did, as well as a half-day uh, symposium that we held at Mount Auburn, um, where we invited regional preservationists hoping to learn from them and also share some of our experiences. Uh, we will also be producing a short video to demonstrate some of the techniques that we use in the field uh, that will be eventually posted on the NCPTT website. Physical characteristics of lead. Lead on the periodic uh, chart of, of elements uh, is represented by the symbol PB. Uh, this stands for plumbum, which was the Latin word for lead. Uh, it's, uh, and of course, um, reminds us of the Romans' extensive use of lead pipes for their water work. Um, uh, lead is uh, classified with an, the other group, with a group of what are called core metals. And the uh, primary characteristic that these metals share is a low melting point, which is crucial for lead. Lead melts at 22 degrees, uh, excuse me, 622 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, unlike gallium, which actually melts, uh, which is another metal that I learned about, melts uh, at room temperature or in your hand. Uh, so lead has a little bit higher melting point than that. Um, also, it's relatively soft and malleable at room temperature, which means that it's very workable in the field, which is uh, um, a very valuable characteristic um, for uh, its use in monuments. It's it also readily forms a stable and insoluble protective layer uh, when it's exposed to weather. Um, this layer, you will see it either as a kind of whitish film that's lead oxide or a slightly thicker, uh, darker lead sulfite that shows on the surface of, of the lead. But it's very stable and durable um, in, in uh, outdoor environments. 
Also, I should mention that it's, it's resistant to some acids, including phosphoric and sulfuric acids. It's weakly affected by hydrochloric and hydrochloric acids, which are often used in mason ray cleaning. Um, it does corrode or uh, will dissolve in organic acids uh, over a period of time, including acetic and oxalic acids. Interestingly, vinegar or acetic acid is used in the Dutch process, hence the Dutch boy on the National Lead Company medallion there. Uh, the Dutch process is a process for creating white lead, which was used in paints, um, and hence the Dutch boy uh, from the Dutch boy paints of uh, the early 19th century, uh, early 20th century. Um, uh, in, in terms of color, it's a chrome silver when it is melted to a liquid, bright bluish silver when solid, and then it turns to a dull gray when it's exposed to air, and then it may acquire this patina of a white film or a darker lead sulfite um, surface. It's a very dense metal. It weighs about 708 pounds per cubic foot, which just for reference is about four times the weight of a cubic foot of granite. Um, so that density is a positive and a negative because when you're carrying any great volume of lead around, it's going to be heavy, um, especially when it can be used, particularly used in roofing, the roofing context. So where does lead come from? Uh, lead is a pure metal. It's, it's rare in nature. It's usually melted out of other minerals and ores that may contain zinc, silver, or copper. Again, its low melting point makes it relatively easy to produce. Lead beads have been found in modern day Turkey that date back to 6400 BC. Um, the Roman Empire was the largest early producer of lead. Production was thought to have peaked during the first two centuries a AD. Uh, ancient Roman mining has been, doc uh, lead mining has been documented in modern day Central Europe, Britain, Balkans, and the Middle East. During the colonial era in America, lead was primarily imported uh, but in the 19th century, lead was discovered in Missouri in what came to be known as the lead belt. And here we have a little engraving uh, from the lead belt, uh, mining and then a little melting house uh, to the side. And on the right is a picture of, of lead bound up with calcite galena, um, out of which it would then be melted. Uh, for reference, that's about a two inch, two or three inch wide piece of uh, mineral. Lead has historically widely been used in buildings. Uh, its workability and durability and its relative abundance made it useful in many trades. In Greek and Roman architecture, it was used uh, in pinning together the pieces of columns, uh, shafts of columns. And here there's a um, um, engraving showing iron pin that is set in a lead socket. The lead um, provided some uh, ability for movement, but also uh, protected the iron from corrosion. Um, and then on the right, we have a, a lead water spigot from uh, Roman times. And then we have a beautiful example of lead roofing. So we know that lead was available and in frequent use in the construction trades, and we know from physical evidence and archival sources, we know it became a popular material for use in the monument industry. One of these archival sources is the Monumental News. Monumental News was a trade magazine that was first published in 1889 and was continually published in one form or another until the early 1960s, at which point it changed its name, and I believe um, I read somewhere that essentially it's still produced as uh, um, under a different name uh, as a trade magazine for the stone industry. Um, the ad contained many ads for lead. There was most often wedge lead, which is specific to the monument trade. Most inter interesting though, in the Monumental News magazine uh, journals are the ask and answered sections and the hints to the handyman section. Um, in these sections, tradesmen would respond to questions that had been asked in previous issues about monument making, setting, or care, and then they would provide 
instructions for various work and you have several references to the use of lead in these sections. Um, there's, uh, we have here an ad that talks about wedge, uh, wedge lead avail being available um, among other monument setting materials. So I mentioned primarily they talk about wedge lead in uh, the um, monumental news. Um, this article is actually from a different magazine, but it's similar to one that you will find in monumental news. This uh, article to the right came from a Montgomery Ward mail order catalog for headstones and grave markers. And uh, clearly it's um, targeted towards the do-it-yourselfer. Gives full instructions for setting monument orders through the mail from Montgom Montgomery Ward. And for granite monuments, they recommend the use of wedge lead placed down along the base. The process was to place uh, wedge lead shims at the four corners as you were placing the die. And then after it was in place, you go around the outside and tamp a wedge lead in around that joint. There are also many references to lead putty in uh, monumental news, and there were various recipes. Lead putty was kind of a precursor to setting compounds today. Uh, there were, like I said, there were various recipes, but primarily it would be white lead mixed with stone dust, and then some linseed oil or another thickening agent that would form a paste. Um, this paste could then either be rolled out uh, and um, then bagged and used and, and uh, held for later use, or in the field, it could be kept in kind of a, a tub and then rolled out in the field. And uh, similar to the use of setting compound today, you would uh, place the stone on, a, on wedge lead shims and then go around the outside. And uh, you could either point with the lead putty or you could lay a, uh, a rope around the outside of, a mon of the monument as you set it. Um, white lead is not something that you can purchase today, uh, except in very small quantities. It's still available for, the, um, uh, for artists, for painters, who sometimes like to mix up their own paints and they prefer to use white lead for various reasons. Uh, so we ordered a couple small packages. They're like $20 for, I think it's measured in grams, um, and mixed up a little bit of this just to try to see what it, how it worked uh, in our shop. And this is an example here. I think what's really nice is the color that you get. We used uh, granite stone dust mixed in with the white lead, and the color was very, uh, was a great match for the monument, for the stone itself. Uh, in the 19 teens, Monumental News um, alluded to a small trend in lead lettering, and um, there were several articles on how to do this. Um, you would uh, cut out a small groove corresponding to the letter in the monument, and then you would tamp in sheet lead, and then these little holes would uh, key the lead as you tamped it in. It would form to those holes, and the sheet lead would keep to the to the groove and we're fortunate at Mount Auburn to have uh, th these are additional examples and you can see more in detail the, the, the holes in the groove. Um, at Mount Auburn we have one example of lead lettering that I, I just think it's especially nice. Unfortunately this monument's not been cleaned um, but uh, in, on close look the, the lettering is just fantastic I think. Craftsmanship. And in an area where the stone at the mid base is fractured, you can see the little hole where the lead was tamped in and, uh, and keyed in. And I assume it's that way on all the lettering. Um, it's a, a, a great example of craftsmanship. Uh, also at Mount Auburn, we have, um, uh, in a, we 
have an abundance of information in our own archives. Here are two letters referring to lead. The uh, letter on the right, uh, these actually both refer to the R.H. White Mausoleum on the grounds of Mount Auburn. And uh, the letter on the right refers to the setting of the columns of this mausoleum on sheet lead and um, the monument granite dealer um, says the lead should be cut back one inch from the edge of the columns um, and the columns are not to be caulked until the mausoleum is complete. I assume that he was talking about using wedge lead to point the joints because uh, the monument is, is leaded throughout the mausoleum there. Um, and then on the left there is a letter from the lot owner uh, referring to Professor's care for this mausoleum and the pointing of the joints in there. Here's a picture of that mausoleum. Um, I think the lead gives especially nice effect aesthetically here in this uh, kind of detail of, uh, you, know, you can see the you know, dull gray of the lead um, is very sympathetic to the, to the granite. Um, it does have a bit of a white patina, grayish white patina from uh, corrosion, that stable corrosion on the surface. And then you can see the darker, um, more black corrosion uh, in this protected area. Um, one of those letters referred to perpetual care for this. It does have perpetual care and it's been pointed several times over the years. Um, here you can see the original lead that they did not take out as they were repointing. It probably has um, as you tamp lead, it can uh, go too far into the joint, so then you have to go back over the top. But this would have been wedge lead here, and then they had lead wool. You can identify some strands that David will talk about later. Um, so they went back and repointed over the wedge lead with a lead wool um, to repoint that. We also have a uh, number of works cards uh, referring to setting and letting monuments um, over there. And then this is a perpetual care estimating sheet that uh, talks about washing and letting in front of the uh, monument or mausoleum. So we know that there's a lot of lead out there. We don't know that it's all original. It could have been used in various repointing or repair. I guess um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, is this an appropriate material to be using uh, as we move forward? Well, uh, we're, we're all of us are preservationists here, we're preservation minded, so uh, we have to consider the original material and historical accuracy. Um, but what function does in any material, uh, what function does it uh, do between the stones? Um, the first of all, it, it forms a cushion for between the stones when you're setting them. Um, and uh, lead is great at absorbing imperfections or, and then after the monu monument has been set for um, absorbing movement in the stone, expansion and contraction. Uh, lead is malleable, as I mentioned, and can absorb that movement so that the stone itself is not damaged. And then um, joints should keep water from penetrating the monument or mausoleum. Um, here, lead is uh, perhaps not perfect material. It doesn't form a, any kind of chemical bond with the stone. It merely fills a gap, and therefore water will be able to get in through capillary action. Um, even through the tightest joints in a soaking rain, there will be some moisture penetrating that joint. But then on the flip side, um, water is able to, through capillary action, again, be drawn out of that small gap between the lead and the stone. Um, in setting of monuments, you would want a material that's relatively efficient to use. Um, lead, in some cases, can be very efficient to use. Um, as I showed in the description of setting a monument for using wedge lead, uh, that can be a pretty quick and efficient process to set the monument and then tamp in lead around the outside. 
It's definitely a durable material. Uh, much of what you see on the ground at Mount Auburn, much that we uh, know or assume to be original is still in fantastic shape. Um, also, it's maintainable. Uh, if a lead works itself out of a joint, it can easily be tamped back in. If um, it also can be recycled, uh, lead, if you're using a molten or poured lead, you can recycle it almost uh, indefinitely over and over again. And then aesthetically, is it a uh, attractive joint? I showed you the R.H. White mausoleum, where at least the lead is a neutral presence on the monument. And um, uh, so aesthetically, it can be pleasing. Also, you get a very tight joint using lead, which probably also was one of its attractions. The wedge leg can be uh, an eighth of an inch or slightly smaller. But you get a very tight joint, much tighter than you can get using, uh, using a mortar or often uh, using a sealant. Um, so on a case-by-case -case basis, we tend to look to see if lead was the original material and then kind of judge using those criteria whether it is an appropriate material to put back into the monument. Uh, we also consider what our options are. This is a monument that was set in about 2005 in a bead of silicone. And you can see that that's already starting to deteriorate. It's a relatively good color match, I guess. Um, simply silicone sealant, but it's already started to deteriorate. And then this is a uh, use of a uh, SETI compound that's in frequent use today. When dealing with lead, obviously, its uh, potential effects on the worker are uh, something to take seriously. Um, I um, urge anyone who is going to be using it uh, in a repair or preservation project to um, develop their own safety protocols. Uh, lead enters the body only through ingestion or inhalation. So um, if you breathe dust or if you get lead on your hands and then it gets on food or uh, something that you're drinking, it can then be ingested. Um, it affects many parts of the, uh, many systems of the body can be acute uh, or a chronic um, problem. There are OSHA standards for lead exposure. They regulate exposure limits and provide guidance for testing lead in air and then for any workers testing lead in their blood. Um, uh, lead dust and fumes pose, pose the biggest threat and that's primarily in industrial um, processes for uh, heat removal, um, or when using a melted uh, molten lead. Uh, so some basic precautions to take. If you're removing lead, you can wet the surface. That will keep any dust down. Wear gloves and a dust mask. Obviously, wash your hands frequently and change clothing after the work day. Therefore, you won't be taking any dust home with you. Um, uh, use a dust mask, as I mentioned, and limit your exposure. Work in a well-ventilated ve area. All of our work is done outside. It's going to be well ventilated, but we still take the uh, other precautions. So I'll now turn it over to David and let him talk about some of our recent projects at Mount Auburn um, using lead in various forms. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, thanks, Gus, and thanks again to NCTTT for uh, for our grant and for putting on this conference. I'm just going to um, excuse me. I have six minutes, so <laughs> it's going to be kind of quick. Um, Oscar Wilde said, "No passion is trivial that's pursued passionately." And for some reason, Gus and I have this passion for lead. Um, it's it's inert, it's uh, simple, and it's deadly, which you can tell by looking at Gus and I. We we are drawn to it. Um, so uh, it, this, this is going to be quick examples of how we use it. Here you can see the molten lead that's been, that's been used to 
anchor these cast iron posts. Um, this is the uh, different forms that it comes in. Um, on the left, we have the lead wool, uh, which you can see it's a, a, like a steel wool, except extruded lead. And on the right, you see the lead ignits uh, that are being good in the furnace, and that's about usually what we use is the 50 pound. But as uh, I, I don't think I addressed this specifically, but um, it's all recyclable. We 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 med. I, I think I, I think I should mention this, but we melt anything we take out wool, wedge lead. We put into a pot and we'll use again. Um, a related product to uh, product to the lead is oakum, which is an infused petroleum infused jute or hemp, which is used uh, a lot in boat building because it will expand. So when this boat goes in the water, the, the planks expand, the oakum expands, and you get this incredibly tight waterproof joint. And then you can see on the right that we're using it um, to back for a backer rod for to tamp some new lead in there. Uh, also, sheet lead and chi lead. Sheet lead, Gus has talked about for um, you know it's used for splashing, obviously, but also for shims. We can get in different thicknesses, so we can adjust the joint, or we can just pound it down and, and make it thinner. Uh, the T lead is used for uh, skyward facing joints, setting uh, caulking, and it makes a really nice and I, I think aesthetically pleasing um, uh, weatherproof joint. And also wedge lead, which Gus talked about, which we don't use as much. It's more for a setting, new setting. Um, and it's hard if, unless you have a really uniform uh, joint to go back in and try to force that in because some's going to slide in and some's going to be proud. So it's more for, for setting lead. So we don't use that a lot. Um, tamp lead wool and molten pour. As Gus mentioned, you can see the um, strands of the lead wool. And this was taken from a uh, monument that we had to um, replace. And to me, that's really beautiful, <laughs> I think. It's like a Japanese um, painting or something. And what amazes us is how they did all this in one like continuous pour. You don't see a lot of cold welds um, between the pours. And obviously, they waste a lot of material. But um, I'm sure it's not that complicated. I can't figure it out how they got this uniform pour um, in that amount of time, because you really have to do it fast, because it sets up really quickly. Um, like any joint that fails, you get biological growth, dirt uh, gets in there, and stuff starts to grow. So we can just take a section, go back with the wool, uh, point it. And the, the real trick with the wool, it, and it takes practice, is that you have to compact it. It's a cold well. It becomes a solid. So um, you have to get it so it comes almost flush. It can be a little proud. And you can trim it, but you don't. If you if you if you um, if you set it, as Gus showed in an earlier uh, slide, you'll just you won't get that um, compaction with a new old lead joint and new wool. It's just not gonna it's not gonna weld together like fresh wool will. So you can get away with it. Uh, it's not uh, ideal, though. Uh, and here is that same monument that's been that middle horizontal joint. I believe is the one that has been repaired. Um, and once it oxidizes, it, it blends in really nicely. I'm, I mean, mortar you can do a lot. You can you can throw some dirt on it, and, but mortar it always kind of looks uh, a little newer than the old stuff. Uh, this is a Kinlick monument that we did uh, a couple years ago. That urn on top had actually had a crack in it, and eventually came uh, completely apart. So it was obviously a uh, really uh, safety concern <laughs> that we had to get on. Um, so we used poured lead in this sh lead shims and then uh, lead wool pointing on the base of the pillar. And as you can see here, um, that's me. And I, I always laugh, I go on YouTube to see people pouring lead just to get tips or pointers or whatever. And so many times they're in short sleeve shirts, you know, maybe they have safety glasses. It's crazy. If you hit just a droplet of moisture, it's gonna explode in you, all over you. And it's happened. And I think my reaction time has probably broken the record for reaction time because you move really quick when molten lead is exploding on you. So I have the, the hood, the gloves, my arms are completely covered, everything's covered, and um, it's just, it's common sense. And as you can see, we just have a propane tank. If you kind of see the bottom right, there's a the cast iron pot. Uh, so it's just a propane fired little plumber's pot. And um, you can see I'm doing the pour there. The ladles we have a nice, they're heavy duty, and they also have a collar on the, on the stem. So you can, it, it, you can just kind of turn it this and it turns in the collar and uh, makes it a little safer than trying to 
the move. And then you just see on the top, there's a little bit of slag there um, with resist impurities that can, you can flux it. Actually, when you melt the lead, you can throw a little wax or heat these off to different things and it cleans up the impurities, brings it up to the top, you skim them off, and you get less of the impurities uh, when you pour. Um, and then at the bottom of that pillar is the lead wool that was missing and that was uh, then replaced by us. And as you can see, it looks like it's been there for a long, long time. Uh, damming for vertical joints and ankle joints, um, what we use is called a Babbitt rate. It's just a molding damming clay that will withstand temperatures up to about 9,000 degrees. Um, so it's ideal for lead and um, it's nice and moldable, it's sticky, so it, it makes a great uh, damming uh, material. Uh, this was a, a rail where we have a rose path at Mount Auburn. Um, I'm not sure why this broke off. There isn't a lot of jacking there. These are just regular steel plumbing type. They have the threads on them and everything. But as you can see, um, that's it's a nice uh, inside look at what the joint looks after it's poured. Um, it's completely covered around. It's uh, nice and tight. Um, as you can see, as in the pour before, they didn't care too much about their material cost because they didn't dam up the pipe and it just kept running. So you have this I think really cool kind of tongue coming out from the ankle. And so this is actually getting that damming, the Babbitt-Wright damming uh, putty and put around in this with a little spigot on the top. Um, so it's just poured and then that's what you get at the end. And that's just all trimmed off and tamped. And so you get this, uh, and as Gus said, it oxidizes in different ways, but Ideally, and this is uh, what I think is ideal, is you get this nice bluish gray hue and it really complements, I think it looks really organic to me and it really um, complements it and it goes well with the granite and it really just kind of blends into the whole monument. Uh, the speaker talked yesterday about uh, lead capping, which we've done some of and it's, I think it's tremendously effective. Um, this is a few we did, uh, uh, some we did a few years ago. Uh, you can, you can, that overhang is probably a little heavy. You could trim that back so it wouldn't look as heavy on the monument. It would give it a little more of a delicate um, touch. Um, and as the speaker said, the critters love lead. It's sweet, tastes like strawberries, I'm told. I haven't tasted it myself, but that's why kids like it. They like strawberries. Um, so as you can see, we, uh, I, did this, I did this cap and it was okay for like four years. It was nothing, it was perfect. And then they found it and they went at it. And they basically ate that whole thing. This is early on in the, in the gnarling. Um, and because I, I used to go around and I see that all the granite curbing we had and it had, lead, all the granite curbing had lead pointing and uh, there was these marks on it. I'm like, is this the scrimmers, you know, from the, from the, the ground crew? But it didn't really look like that. And I, I didn't put it together for a while, but that's what they're doing. They, they, they love it and they gnaw on it. Um, there's no getting around it. What I've came up, I've come up, I've come up with, which I think is working pretty well, is I took B72 and added hot sauce, and then I paint that on to deter them from, you know, like you put around your garden, right, or garlic or hot sauce or something really offensive. So I put that on, and I haven't done really any, you know, scientific experiments. I guess you should probably reapply it every year or two, um, but it seems to be working for what we've done. Um, again, I. A nice thing about lead too is also that you can be retamped if it, the lead doesn't really fail. I mean, the, the, the stones move and so they'll eventually work it, work it out of the joint, but it can be retamped and um, you don't get the best joint at the butt, but it, it, it's, it's uh, accepted. Uh, and this is a Shaw monument. This is uh, Robert Gould Shaw who left the, who led the 54th regiment, I believe, of uh, the first official African-American unit. Uh, and they, he died down in South Carolina where he's buried. Um, they would not let him, um, they said something really nasty about where he, that he should stay with his troops. Um, so this is his family. The bronze plaque you see missing there is uh, uh, in a uh, uh, plaque to Robert Gould Shaw. Um, but he is, not, he is not there. So we had, this was a complete restoration. We um, recast a missing uh, cast iron fence. Um, the ancient uh, marble in the middle there was restored and the, the, the enclosure was uh, restored. And so then uh, Steve Brown, who's a preservation craftsperson and myself, we uh, put uh, caulking in the joint and then you can see the tea lettuce and then it's just formed with wooden blocks to kind of um, work its way in there and 
pick up all the irregularities of the stone. You can also see that cramp in there that was also had lead around it to secure that and um, waterproof it. And so that's the finish. That's probably before it really oxidized. So once, I, once again, when it oxidized, it gets that nice um, organic um, feel, uh, nice bluish gray. And, it, and even with, with this uh, sandstone, it, it blended in nicely. Uh, one of the more interesting things I ran into <laughs> is this gentleman, there's got to be better ways. He poured, as you can see, he poured molten lead into his ear. Um, it did not kill him right away. He, he it was in agony for five months and eventually um, died of lead poisoning. And you can see they, they drilled it out of his ear, but they didn't want to get too close to the brain. It's like, why, why not just <laughs> take the chance? Anyways, that's... Uh, that was one of the more interesting things I found. Um, so and that was, as you can see, 1908. Uh, ironically, he was buried in a lead coffin. I'm making that up. He was not buried in, I don't know what he was buried in. But this is an image I found of a lead coffin that was unearthed. I'm not sure where it was from. Um, but again, this lead's all over. It's very versatile. And you can see it, it held up really well um, underground. So that's just a good question. Thanks very much.